one of the major reasons for uh, reducing popularity of cement dip is the fear of bone cement implantation syndrome. Uh, the fear is so much that some of the centers in our city have given up using a cemented hip and surgeons also advise against it. But is there truth in that? Should we be worried or should we try and uh, get over this fear? So bone cement implantation syndrome is the hypoxia, hypotension or sometimes a loss of consciousness that uh, comes up when you are cementing the hip or when you are reducing the hip or sometimes when you are uh, reducing the, deflating the tunic in the total knee replacements. Occasionally it can progress to cardiac arrhythmias and rarely some arrest can be seen. So when can it be, uh, when is it, uh, when do you get it? It can happen in any cemented procedure. It may be a bipolar, a THR, a revision THR, a TKR, uni, revision TKR, or a shodatoplasty. It is even reported in vertebroplasty and kyphoplasties. The incidence, if you go through literature, ranges between multiple series from 15 to 30 percent, but the severe uh, type of reaction is seen, is, is seen in about 3 to 8 percent of the uh, cases, and rarely the mortality, if you see, ranges from 0.2 percent to 2 percent in some of the series. Not only the perioperative mortality, but there is also a high 30 day, gray, 30 day and one year mortality associated with the severe grades of uh, BCIS, and hence we need to really try and avoid this by taking a few uh, careful steps during your procedure. First is to understand why, why is this happening. Initially it was thought that monomer is the main reason for all this and the monomer in circulation co induces all these changes of hypotension and hypoxia. But uh, studies have shown that the levels of uh, monomer in the circulation is not always very high and does not explain for uh, all the changes. The most widely accepted or believed reason is embolism. Embolism can occur whenever uh, there is increased uh, or high intramedullary pressure during cementation or uh, introduction of your prosthesis. The debris contains fat, marrow, cement particles, air, bone and aggregates of platelet and fibrin. This embolus usually um, uh, goes and lodges into the pulmonary circulation. Sometimes it can escape through the patent foramen ovale and go into the cerebral or the coronary circulation and causes all the changes. So mechanically it can induce uh, damage to the endothelium which leads to reflex vasoconstriction uh, which can cause uh, some moment of problems there or because of the vasoactive and the chemical mediators that it uh, releases you can have increased uh, the pulmonary, pulmonary uh, vascular resistance or decreased systemic vascular resistance causing hypoxia and then uh, uh, hypovolemia and hypotension. Also, uh, sometimes the amount of embolism that is seen in the uh, circulation does not correlate with the hypotension. So some people thought it was something else and they have found that there is always increased levels of histamine in the circulation when uh, in a hypotensive patient and they thought it was something like a type 1 hypersensitivity. Also levels of C3A and C5A are high in these patients and they also lead to vasoconstriction and bronchoconstriction. So these also do play a role. So now it is believed that all the above processes, uh, processes play a role and it is a combination of everything and how your patient is going to react will depend on what kind of physiological response the patient gives to the episode and also his physiological reserves. So initial, uh, initial episode is increased uh, pulmonary vas uh, vascular resistance which leads to right ventricular ejection fraction reduction which then uh, the right ventricle dilates and it pushes the intervertebral uh, septum into the left ventricle and ultimately leads to reduced filling of the left ventricle leading to cardiac redu reduction in cardiac output leading to hypotension and sometimes uh, further leading to arrest. So Donaldson in 2009 uh, introduced us to the grading. 90% uh, of the time you have a grade 1 kind of a reaction where the hypoxia, uh, the O2 falls up to 94% but does not go below that. The hypertension, the systemic uh, systolic blood pressure does not go below 20% of the baseline. Type 2 reaction or the grade 2 reaction is where the hypoxia is severe and the PO2 may fall up to 88% or the BP may fall more than 40% of the baseline and sometimes you get unexpected loss of consciousness. Grade 3 is when you have frank cardiovascular collapse and which needs uh, CPR. So the best way to reduce the incidence of this syndrome is trying to anticipate it, then detect it early and uh, aggressively manage it. We need to identify your high risk patients and then so you can anticipate the problem and uh, by increased monitoring we can detect early changes and then, then aggressively manage it to avoid any problems further. So what are the risk factors? The 
uh, ASA grade 3 and 4 patients are associated uh, with uh, higher degrees or higher grades of uh, BCIS. Older patients, male patients are known to have higher chance. Patients who have COPD or old cardiac diseases or if they have pulmonary hypertension or even renal patients with raised creats are known to have higher incidence of BCIS. Osteoporosis, metastasis, fractures, especially pathological and intertrochanteric region is known to increase have increased vascularity in the region and opens up abnormal vascular channel, uh, channels through which embolism can occur. Revision surgery obviously is longer and is going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot more blood loss, so in, there's a higher chance there. If you have a previously uninstrumented femur, then there's a higher chance. Use of longer stem is also known to uh, be associated with uh, BCIS. Again, patients are diuretics or on warfare, you need to be more careful because again, there's a higher incidence there. So once you have a patient, you need to recognize the risk factors uh, in, the, in your patient and you need to discuss it with your team. Your team needs to be uh, you, your anesthetist and your intensivist and three of you all together need to realize and analyze the patient and do the best what you can do. Try and optimize the patient's pre-op uh, condition by managing the comorbidities. Again, discuss the uh, management with your team and assign roles to each team member and when, decide when what is to be done. Discuss with the surgical team when all uh, this can happen during uh, canal entry or reaming or when cementing the acetabulum or the femur or while inserting the prosthesis or while reducing a joint. When it comes to anesthesia, uh, uh, literature advises us that the best anesthesia in this patient is a low dose spinal with epidural with no, uh, preferably no sedation. Generally, GA should be avoided as it involves nitrous oxide and volatile drugs which again uh, increase the chances of embolism. And again, in epidural, plain or simple epidural again is not very good because you can't control the hypovolumia very well. So you need to sit with your uh, team and make some kind of protocol. I like this uh, cement curfew protocol which is followed by Coventry University Hospital and uh, it helps us uh, prepare everyone, the, all the team members as to how and when you are going to in, uh, do the things and what role do the, uh, does everyone need to play. So this is what we follow at our, uh, at our institute. Basically, when there is a high risk patient, the monitoring increases, the BP and PO2 and ETCO2 is monitored every two minutes instead of the normal five or 10 minutes. Uh, fall of uh, the end tidal CO2 is usually the first sign of BCIS. So be, uh, be aware, talk to your anesthetist and be aware of this finding. As soon as there is a change, you need to aggressively try and manage. Uh, in our institute, they always put a central uh, CVP line so that they, could, they can replace the fluid properly and not overload the heart. Occasionally, SVC filters have been used where there is a very, very high risk patient, but we had to use a cemented because of osteoporosis. The first clinical sign would be delirium, loss of consciousness or dyspnea. So anesthetist has to be very aware of this and they need to be uh, talking to the patient or interacting with the patient to uh, understand the occurrence of this. Again, they need to prepare for a severe reaction and be prepared for a CPR. The anesthesia team needs to be uh, alerted before we start our cementing so that they ensure that uh, the, the fluid is properly replaced and uh, the blood pressure should usually be within 20% of the uh, pre-surgery baseline. They should start oxygen, oxygenating the patient. Sometimes drugs like corticosteroid, histam, histaminic, antihistaminics, and bronchodilators are used. Some centers have advised low dose epinephrine to try and uh, maintain the blood pressure or raise the blood pressure before cementing. Our anesthesia team always keeps the inotropes and vasopressors ready in case there's a collapse. Again, uh, there has to be uh, every time when you are changing your, or doing your process, next step, you need to be uh, speaking to anesthetic, they need to be aware of the progress of your surgery. They need to be uh, highly vigilant for any changes and uh, our team normally says they treat it like a right ventricular failure. So as a surgical team, what do we need to do? The first step that we need to do is try and achieve very, very meticulous hemostasis as any uh, blood loss could lead to hypovolumia, which again would precipitate this, uh, uh, this uh, problem. When you, uh, your uh, preparation starts as soon as you open the canal, as soon as you open the canal, suck out all the content from the canal, then give your cop uh, copious lavage, preferably I use a pulsatile lavage, give enough lavage so that you are very happy that you have uh, sucked out or removed all the debris from your canal and your uh, suction, what you are sucking is absolutely clear. clear. Now you can prepare your canal with your brooches. At the end of your preparation, uh, brush and plug your canal and dry the canal and then pack it with a vent uh, 
uh, the tube needs to be continuously attached to a suction so that it keeps on sucking out whatever debris or blood loss or blood or air that gets collected there. Then again, inform, inform your anesthesia team before you start mixing and be uh, sure that they are prepared with uh, their uh, uh, preparations. Use of low viscosity cement is known to uh, be better as it has lesser incidence of BCIs because of the less pressure that it generates. Vacuum mixing the cement reduces the monomer vapors and definitely helps in reducing embolism. Retrograde filling the cement using a gun and with continuous suction through the vent is definitely useful in reducing embolism. Avoid excessive pressurization. Sometimes you, if there's a high risk patient, you can reduce or you can be a bit lenient with your pressurization to avoid uh, changes. Again, when you insert your prosthesis, you should not be using force or hammering. You gently in introduce it. Use stems as short as possible because long stems are definitely known to be uh, associated with uh, BCIS. Then gently uh, reduce your hip. Uh, gent uh, it's advisable not to hold your limb in uh, flexion and internal rotation for a long time because that leads to kinking of the vessels which can again cause stasis and turbulence and which can cause embolism which then release into circulation when you reduce it. So uh, try and release that uh, uh, extreme position as much as possible. Usually BCIS sets in about 10 minutes after you've introduced the cement. So, and uh, usually you get the changes between 10 and 20 minutes, beyond 20 minutes generally, you do not see any changes. So be very uh, meticulous or be very alert. Observe the patient for about 20 minutes after you've introduced your cement and prosthesis. If there's an issue or a BCI sets in, with this, then the anesthetist needs to take over and uh, resuscitate the patient. Sometimes there was an occasion I remember when I had to turn the patient from lateral to supine and they had to, uh, 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 you know, uh, resuscitate the patient and then we turn the patient later on and then finish our uh, process, uh, procedure later on. So uh, the best to avoid uh, the severe reactions in BCIs is to anticipate it in, in our high risk patients, then detect it by early monitoring of your patients and then prepare your team for, team for aggressive, and, uh, um, aggressive management of the problem so that you don't have severe reactions and leading to mo increased mortality. Thank you for your patient. Here.